Hello everybody and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar. My name is Ivor Blumenthal and uh, I've been invited um, very graciously by Ruhan to uh, address you guys on a number of topics. Ruhan, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. I see you are online. Oh, right, there you go. Right, we can hear you. Uh, Ivor, can you hear me now? I can, oh, great. Yes. Well, good evening to you. And actually, thank you very much for uh, for uh, um, making contact with us when we reached out for you. And I think we're all very excited to hear what you have to say to us. And maybe at the right stage of the game, uh, we're all in a position now that we need to start facing landlords, although we have communicated. Um, I just wanted to point out that uh, although we reached out for you, um, Regarding dynamic vision, we have extended this uh, meeting to other independent optometrists and ophthalmologists and some other people in the industry that are also tenants. So um, there would be some other people here as well. But thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, we really appreciate it. Good. Thank you so much. And uh, please, ladies and gentlemen, feel free to either ask questions by unmuting your microphone or alternatively by using the chat facility. Uh, please feel free to ask uh, any questions uh, that you deem necessary. So, um, yes, my name is Ivor Blumenthal and I'm a CEO of a number of organizations, but for this instance, the South African Independent Tenants Association, which is an association of um, retailers, um, commercial um, uh, lessees, and uh, manufacturing and factory lessees. But essentially, the principal distinction, I think, of sites as members are companies which in fact are doing less than uh, 20 or 30 million rands a year in terms of turnover, whereas the uh, SME de definition being used at the moment by the Department of Trade and Industry in association with the pigs, believe that or not, that's what the property industry group call themselves, the pigs. Uh, it's a combination of the South African Property Owners Association, SA Rights, and the South African Shopping Center Council. Uh, and they collectively call themselves the PIGS, the Property Industry Group. Um, and I will talk a little bit more uh, uh, about how they've actually uh, come together and the impact they, they will be having. I'm just going to mute that mic. There we go. And the impact that they will be having uh, on your businesses, whether you are a retail optometrist, uh, whether you are a ophthalmologist or specialist, in, in rented offices, um, or alternatively a manufacturing optometrist um, uh, or within a, a commercial or factory setting. Um, but that certainly is one of the components of what we're gonna be talking about tonight. Um, so again, thank you and uh, let's get going. So these are the four areas I'm gonna be talking around tonight, but please again, feel free to introduce any questions. And I'm only too happy to deal with them as and when they crop up. I want to talk about the lockdown and essential services as they are defined in the latest regulations. And the latest regulations are those of the 29th of April, the disaster management regulations, as released by the uh, Minister of Cooperative Governance, and that's uh, Nkosazama Zuma. Um, and importantly, I want to talk about how they apply to retail businesses and optometry businesses in particular. I'm then going to talk just within the context of essential services and lockdown. I'm going to talk about the temporary employee relief scheme. Um, it's now in its second month, April being the first month. It's had its ups and downs, but we're going to talk a little bit about the technicalities around TERS uh, so that we can also talk a little bit in the same breadth around the technicalities of the unemployment insurance fund generally. Um, because those of you who are essential services will know that you're excluded from TERS if you're not locked down, but you aren't necessarily excluded from other UIF benefits for your staff members. So I do want to talk about that. I then want to talk about dealing with landlords and managing agents. And there I'll talk a little bit about the block release that the Department of Trade and Industry put out. And I want to also talk about the South African uh, uh, Independent Tenants Association's approach to landlords. Uh, and what I think we should be doing as, as, as dynamic vision number one, but rather on behalf of optometry in general uh, in a relationship with landlords. 
Uh, and then I'm going to be talking about uh, dealing with the Department of Trade and Industry in terms of aid and relief packages for small businesses. And many of you are small businesses. And again, I say doing under 80 million rand turnover, uh, in fact, doing under 20 million rand turnover, whereas the DTI talk about small businesses as, um, you know, anything less than 80 million rand. Um, and then I want to talk about CITES strategy on dealing with DTI on behalf of small and independent tenants, but importantly, on behalf of the optometry sector, because I doubt that as a business sector, the Allied Health Professions Council or the Health Professions Council is adequately taking care of your needs as businesses in uh, discussions and engagement with DTI, um, and not in this instance with the Department of Health. And then obviously we'll go to questions and answers. So that is the agenda for the next hour or so. So welcome to this, uh, to this webinar. So to get started, um, and I'm just going to take the liberty of doing this. I'm going to take the liberty of exiting here so that I can quickly call up the uh, Gazette. And that's the Gazette. The Gazette, which currently governs how you operate under um, the disaster situation, is in fact this Gazette here. It was uh, gazetted on the 29th of April. Um, and it had gone through a number of different iterations by the time, essentially, by the time it's become law. And what's important about this Gazette is not so much the first 25 odd pages, but more importantly, when it starts to talk about what are essential services and how those essential services should, in fact, be dealt with. Now, the first area of the Essential Service uh, Gazette under Alert Level 4, and as you know, we're under Alert Level 4, and what you need to be aware of is that we as South Africa are, on, are under Alert Level 4, but there has been talk over the last week and a half, and it's currently being negotiated, that there are some provinces, and here we talk specifically about the Western Cape, we talk about KZ, and then we talk about Gauteng, some of those uh, provinces which might actually find themselves being level five pretty soon because of what's going on at the moment with the climb in numbers. Um, I don't necessarily believe that level five is going to affect you uh, as optometrists or optometry businesses um, only because you are regarded as essential services under five or in fact now under four. The first area I want to deal with, however, is the fact that some of you actually fall into the manufacturing sector um, and not only under the professional optometry sector. So a manufacturing optometrist, for example, um, would fall under Part C of the regulations um, and therefore would be permitted generally to be open, um, uh, open at least to 30%, if not to 100% of your business. Can I just ask, within this uh, grouping which is uh, on tonight, are there any manufacturing optometrists or, in fact, optometrists uh, or, or manufacturing businesses that, 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 that operate in the area of optometry? Or, in fact, Ruan, is this exclusively retail and uh, professional uh, practicing optometrists that we're dealing with tonight? Um, I have an interesting question. Um, it depends whether the cutting of lenses falls under manufacturing because uh, some of our lenses are, can be cut in store. Uh, we don't manufacture any lenses as in South Africa. There's maybe one optometrist that has one of those machines that uses a form of injection molding. So maybe that will more fall under the laboratories. So um, in terms of what you've just explained, then at the very least, Part C3 would apply. The manufacturing of plastics and packaging um, uh, permitted to scale up to full employment and subject to strict, strict health protocols. I want to use it as an opportunity to explain what scaling up to full employment means, because that is a um, concept which is pervasive through the regulations and applies to any business which is essentially employing more than 10 people. Now, when they talk about scaling up, they're talking about the fact that you are expected to return to work if you haven't been uh, in essential service um, service up until now. You're expected to return to work in four stages, um, the first stage being a cleaning and preparation in terms of standard operating protocol in your business stage. 
the second stage being your first 33% of your workforce back to work, then the next 33%, and then the final 33%. I just, I'm not going to belabor the point except to say that that four-stage graduated process of returning to work or opening your business should be done over a minimum of two weeks, if not a month or longer. Uh, if there are any questions in that regard, only too happy to take them. And I see that there is one individual that says we manufacture lenses on the chat group. Well, then, if you manufacture lenses, you would very much fall under C3 and then also potentially, at the very least, C9. But I imagine C3 more so than C9. And therefore, under C3, you are permitted over time, that time being at least two weeks to a month, to, to fully scale up. Um, uh, to full employment, uh, obviously subject to your strict health protocols, only too happy to deal with what those strict health protocols are if you aren't already aware of them. However, within this particular regulation, and I will make this regulation available to you, Ruan, so that you can make it available on your group. If you want to, you can invite me onto your WhatsApp group and I'll just post these things directly. But uh, this, this uh, regulation would certainly apply. So under manufacturing, C3, very definitely, David, would apply to you. Um, if you are concerned that you don't deal in plastics, the, uh, but that you deal in something else, uh, metal, presumably, um, then certainly at the very least C9 would apply to you, where you're entitled to scale up to 30% of employment, but I would imagine you'd be covered by C3. Um, as far as retail optometrists are concerned, uh, there's no question that as retail optometrists, you very equally fall under uh, uh, E7, medical and hospital supplies, medicine equipment and personal protective equipment. You very uh, clearly fall under C, uh, C, uh, E7 um, and uh, you're fully entitled then to be 100% operational uh, in that business. Let me also say this, that if there are some of you who in fact offer online sales, um, either sales orders or sales supply, then uh, E20 would apply to you. And if for whatever reason you feel that you don't want to open a retail business because of the natural hazards, or in fact because of the fact that shopping centers are empty, then you could very easily um, decide that you want to open your retail business online. Uh, and as you can see, E20 says that you, uh, uh, you can open on an incremental basis e-commerce, taking into account the need to limit the extent of movement on the road, contact between people, law enforcement challenges, and the impact of other businesses. Now, what you must know about E20 is that there is this, um, there is this assumption that you have, in fact, to be working through courier services if you do want to open an online order and delivery service. That's absolutely not true. And in fact, as one very wise person said to me, surely in a business that employs 10 people, where only two or three people are now occupied in this online business, the other people can be couriers, act as couriers if they've got transport. The answer is absolutely, absolutely, you're fully entitled to do that. So it, it's about how creatively you want to reestablish your business during the time of lockdown if you do not want to open it. However, I do need to say to you that you are fully entitled under E7 to be opening your uh, retail optometry business. So we've dealt with manufacturing, we've dealt with retail. Um, any questions in that regard? Now, uh, e, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, E20 sorry, um, E is going to require you to seek permission from the Optometry Association only because of competition commission laws and regulations in the medical sector. Um, Rohan, again, I don't know if there's an online component uh, to your network of optometrists out there or in fact within the optometry sector as a whole i'm sure you could in fact uh, 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 enlighten me in that regard um i don't think in our group there are any online um, stores yet there are some contact lens online stores but that's a debate of of, of a different nature which i wouldn't like to get into is there an ethical consideration is there an ethical consideration if one of your patients, for example, wants to simply reorder a set of lenses or frames, is there an ethical consideration where you would need first to do a, a, a full uh, um, 
examination of them before you're entitled to dispense? Uh, on contact lenses, we all have taken the position that the script needs to be valid for six months. Um, on spectacles, it's a risk that the customer will take if their eyes have changed, I think, within that period. But the, on, on spectacles, no. Contact lenses, yes. Okay. Uh, all right. So, so really, ladies and gentlemen, all I want to say to you is think about E20 if you're concerned about PPEs or if you're concerned about the fact that you're going to be operating in a dead center for a period of time then think about E20. Um, if it's going to be done on a grand scale basis, so as a practical example, Ron, if you did as a group want to apply to the Optometry Association or alternatively DTI directly for authorization um, for e-commerce, uh, and it wasn't just one company, uh, then that's in fact what you would do. You would apply to DTI under the E20 directive and you would ask them for authorization uh, for your group, but it's really not a difficult thing uh, uh, to do. Okay, um, and there uh, there are no other um, uh, components uh, except for the uh, ophthalmology professional services. And when you talk about professional services, that falls under P, and it falls under P1, which is medical and veterinary services, which are permitted, and it's under those. So the reason I'm showing you this table, ladies and gentlemen, is for when a uh, South African police force person or alternatively a defense force person knocks on your door when you do open your doors, you can literally show them and refer them uh, to anything uh, from A in under Table 1 um, of the Government Gazette of 29th of April all the way through to, uh, in fact, P, which is what we've just discussed. So anything from A all the way through to P, you can show them on the table where you exist um, and uh, essentially then uh, you will be covered under this particular regulation. What I do want to show you is um, uh, ba, 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 ba. what I do want to show you is in fact uh, the essential service listing, um, which is Annex D or page 35 of this particular regulation. And as you can see there, under uh, a D. Um, B1, medical health, laboratory, uh, medical health services, laboratory services, medical services, national institutes. So you fall under uh, B1 of the essential service annexure um, uh, there. Uh, so there's absolutely nothing for you to have to worry about. And then very finally, if you have a largish workplace of more than 10 people, you're going to have to implement a workplace plan. Uh, and in fact, page 38 of this document deals with what needs to be in your workplace plan. But from what I understand, the vast majority of you employ less than 10 people and therefore are truly a small retail operations. It would be useful, I think, um, uh, Ruan, for you across all of your various uh, uh, affiliates to develop a guide, a workplace plan guide around these six areas of recommendation, uh, which is in Annex E of the um, and actually of the regulation um, or of the Government Gazette of the 29th. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is principally the document then that determines if you want your, um, your state of being, your reason to operate, um, your essential service status, but more importantly, your manufacturing service status and your professional practitioner service status. I was asked a question. If we are uh, listed as an essential service, but we choose for a variety of reasons, including our staff choosing not to want to come to work so that we're not in a position to open, are we automatically expected to open? The answer is absolutely not. You are not automatically expected to open. You can decide to remain on lockdown until we are at level three or at level two. You are not automatically expected to open. There are some advantages in not opening. For example, the Unemployment Insurance Fund Temporary Employee Relief Scheme, uh, which is available where you have essentially laid your staff off, all of your staff, by the way. In fact, anybody amongst your staff on whose behalf for the last three months prior to lockdown, you were in fact paying um, uh, unemployment insurance fund would then qualify under lockdown for you to be able to receive temporary employee relief. And I want to talk a little bit about temporary employee relief. But before I do, are there any questions about the disaster management regulations that I just so quickly covered? Um, anything that is confusing you? Ladies and gentlemen, feel free, please, now to ask the question before I move on.
All right. Again, let me say that if you do have a question, please put it in the chat um, facility, and uh, I'll be only too happy to read it and to, to respond. Um, good. So, so moving on. Let me talk a little bit about temporary employee relief. Um, the Unemployment Insurance Fund Temporary Employee Relief Scheme was created in the instance where a company had to lock down and therefore was obliged to lay off its staff for the period of the lockdown. For the period of the lockdown, um, your staff member is not regarded as being your employee, and therefore you are uh, not obliged to pay that staff member. It's a no work, no pay scenario or situation. And because the government realized and recognized that that's your right as an employer in terms of the uh, Basic Conditions of Employment Act, um, they have come in and they've said that we will pay, government will pay, the unemployment insurance fund will pay. Um, because remember, you've been paying money into that fund as an insurance policy. The unemployment insurance fund will pay for the full period of the lockdown, starting with April, May and June. And if it's extended after June, beyond that period as well. Now, how much they will pay is totally dependent on how much the person has been earning. But essentially, um, they will pay from 60% all the way up at the most senior levels to 38% of the ceiling amount of the highest paid people's salary, which is 17,720 Rand. So anything beyond 17,720 Rand will not attract temporary employee relief payments, but up to that amount, everybody in the business on whose behalf UIF has been paid would be paid 38%, which is essentially 6,750 Rand, for the highest uh, earners in your business. And below that, for anyone earning less than um, uh, 17,720 Rand, they would pay from 60% of 3,501 Rand upwards all the way up to that 38% of the 17,720 Rand. Um, now, if you have, and, and the application process is online, it has to be done by the employer. This is the only one of the unemployment insurance fund funds where the employer applies for um, payment and the employee doesn't. Ordinarily and normally, only the employee has access to the unemployment insurance fund and the employer is not allowed to apply on their behalf. Now, the reason I emphasize that last fact is that um, if you are an essential service, but in fact you're open, but at the same time you're only working half day, or you've put your staff on reduced hours or reduced income, the individual staff member for all of the other unemployment insurance fund policies would be entitled to apply to the unemployment insurance fund for um, a payment against the difference between what you're paying or the number of hours that you indeed are paying an individual for as opposed to what their full salary would be. So practical example is if the person gets 10,000 Rand a month, but you've halved their salary to 5,000 Rand a month because you've halved the number of hours you expect from them, then in fact, for the balance, the other 5,000 Rand, they would be entitled to some payment from the Unemployment Insurance Fund for reduced hours on a sliding scale of 60% through to 38%, depending on how much they're actually being paid. Um, but they would have to apply for the subsidy for reduced hours in their own right with a letter from you to say their hours have been reduced, as opposed to if you were completely locked down and laid your employees off, uh, the company would apply on their behalf for the temporary employee refund and then pay that over to the staff member or prepay the staff member against what you anticipate getting from TERS. And then when you get to setting it off against what you've already prepaid. There is one additional, not complicating factor, but one additional factor on TERS, and that is this. Because you are adopting a strict no work, no pay policy, in other words, we are locked down, we are not paying the employee anything, we are claiming UIFTERS, you're also entitled to allow your staff members to in cash any leave which they might have built up. This is one of the few occasions where, where as the employer you're entitled to say to them, You've got leave due. We want you to take the leave now during the lockdown period while you're temporarily laid off so that whatever we get from TER on your behalf can be supplemented by any paid leave which is due to you so that we can get as close to your salary, your normal salary as possible, 
um, uh, so that you're not going to be massively out of pocket. Now, you would have ordinarily done that for April, but I do want to emphasize something else to you. If you are in May now and you're locked down and you haven't applied for temporary employee relief, or there are some members who are laid off, but other members who are not laid off, then for the members who are laid off, you can retroactively apply for UIFTERS backdated to the 1st of April, in fact, to the 26th of March. Now, that's critically important because everybody was told that the 30th of April was a, a closing date for the TERS application. The Minister of Labor and Employment changed his mind. And so as a result, you can any time between April, May and June, which is the anticipated period for TERS, at any time you can apply for TERS. And if you're successful in the application, and there's no reason you shouldn't be successful if you've been playing UIF on behalf of your staff members, but at any time you can apply. And if you're successful, then whatever is paid out to you will be paid out retroactively from the first day of lockdown for that three month period. And uh, uh, so you're, you're entitled then to at least get something back for what you've paid your staff member in April, what you're intending to pay your staff members who are laid off for May and for June as well. Um, TERS has become a complicated thing only because the Department of Labor have handled it absolutely pathetically. But it is a system which is repairing itself. Uh, and certainly SARS is getting involved in that repairing process. So we're likely to see a massive improvement in how the UIF TER system is running. Can I ask, um, is there uh, anybody amongst us tonight who in fact is either locked down or partially locked down? In other words, some of your staff are laid off where you've applied for TERS, where you've maybe been paid out for TERS, or in fact, where you've had complications with TERS. I see there's Andy on the line. Andy, do you want to ask a question in that regard? Yeah. I just wanted to just say that um, I think all three of those apply. Um, I've had tremendous hassles uh, administratively with them. Out of five employees, they paid for one, and they paid something like five times her normal salary and all the others they never paid anything so i'm locked in some sort of um, queries with them at the moment and it's yeah it's been a nightmare uh logic would dictate that if they paid five times her normal salary that they might have paid a globular figure for you under one person's name but that has applied to everybody no. you've applied for no that they actually made mention of the ones that they didn't pay for and they said they weren't registered, yet yet they acknowledged that um, I am registered and, and the other person was registered. So, yeah, it just didn't make sense. All right, anyway, so, I'm on to them. So. Okay, so Andy, let me say this to you. I'm, I'm only too happy to make uh, the name and the contact detail of someone I've used for a number of my clients. She's absolutely fantastic. Her name is Carol, and uh, I'm only too happy to make her details available to you. Ruan, I'll make them available to you. Thank you. She has helped in a Thank number you, of different industries. And I don't know what she does, but she, she's about the only person I know who can get through to these people, literally, physically get through to yeah. them. Because I don't know if you've tried to phone yeah. them. I have, and I've literally tried eight times on yeah. average 15 minutes a time, and I've just given up every single time. They don't reply to the email address uh, either. So the bottom line is um, uh, you need help. Uh, if, and if you do, I'm only too happy to make her details available to you. Um, Appreciate it. Thanks, Ava. Yeah, no, thank you. Contact uh, you through Ron. Of course you can. I see there's someone here who says, I've thank been you. paid for April by TERS. Went quite smoothly, although complicated and confusing. I know it is. I'm going to say to you that if you employ less than 10 people, rather do an individual application for each person rather than the CSV application because their CSV process is, well, let's just say it's very special. It was designed in India. It was run by a program which was written in India that no South African understands the logic of. And in fact, the people who wrote and designed it are absolutely incomprehensible. When the South African call center gets hold of them, it's a little bit like that, um, like that call on 702 once. I don't know if you ever heard, but they got the Chinese restaurant to speak to the Indian restaurant. And that's a little bit like what goes on with tours and Department of Labor when you get through to their call center. But nevertheless, um, there are people who've been paid. Now, there are some people who've been surprised that they've been paid more than they thought they would be paid. 
Um, be aware of the fact that if you got paid at the end of April, you actually got paid for 35 days because you got paid for the days in March uh, when uh, uh, lockdown first um, uh, started. And then also please be aware that if you have been paid for April, all you have to do is submit the various documents of proof that you've paid the employees with what you were paid, either as an advance, which you're now entitled to do and set off the TR against, or after you've received TR, you've paid within five days. As long as you simply submit your payroll proof that you've paid these people, you will automatically be paid again at the end of May. You don't have to put in a new application, and then you'll automatically be paid again at the end of June. You don't have to put in a new application. We discovered something today that was quite worrying. Uh, we heard about it over the weekend where the, the Minister of Labor and his proletariat henchmen um, announced to the world that uh, – uh, you know, that, that they're going to set employee off against employer. Well, um, we heard today, and in fact, I did an interview on it that I'll make available to you a little later, but uh, that what the Department of Labor have done is they've now published the names of the companies that have been paid out and the amount of money that was paid out to them. Um, and so any employee can now go in, type in their own ID number, and that ID number will bring up the employer's name who it was paid for them and how much they were paid, irrespective of whether that money was paid for that employee or for another employee, and irrespective of whether or not the amount that was paid covers all of the claims. So it's a, a really nasty situation that the Minister of Employment and Labor has created, but that's essentially because he's pandering to the trade unions and trying to set off the employers against the trade unions. So you need to be aware of it. And if your employees do come to you and say, well, we have proof that you've been paid out, why haven't you paid us? Uh, and you know that it was either part payment or, as is the case we found out today, there are a number of employers where it's indicated that they have been paid, but they've not received the money, which is even worse. Uh, and that's five days ago. In fact, sometimes um, uh, we, we checked with five employers today only to find out that the payment uh, statement that the Department of Labor was making online was that they were paid out at the end of April and they still haven't received any payout whatsoever. So you've just got to be very, very careful about the, the information which is being put out in your name as an employer by the Department of Labor on your behalf. They have ulterior motives. It's not, a, it's not pure motives simply to pay the employees but to really create a red herring of where the real problem for TER mismanagement has come from. So you've just got to be aware and woke to that, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, Andre, I've read your statement. Uh, get hold of Carol Getter to check up what's going on. You can, by the way, go online and check up yourself and just click on the declined button to see why you haven't been paid out and what their reasoning is for, for not having paid you out. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is temporary employee uh, relief. Now, remember, it's relief. It is an absolute payment to you. You're not expected to pay it back, um, but it is not going to be the full amount that the person is, in fact, owed as a salary. It's only a percentage of what they would be paid as a salary. All right, let me move on now. I want to talk about dealing with landlords and managing agents. Um, round about the... Uh, uh, the 27th, 28th of March, the Minister of Trade and Industry promulgated something he called a block release, which was for the property sector, where the purpose, purpose of the block release was to allow um, tenants, particularly in locked down businesses, but also essential service businesses where, in fact, your income had been significantly reduced. Number one, to co congregate as a group to affiliate as a group, and number two, to engage with landlords. Unfortunately, what has happened is that the landlords have basically engaged with themselves to the exclusion of their tenants, and they've missed the point of what lockdown is about. So lockdown has basically decimated the retail businesses which are locked down and therefore mothballed, or decimated at least 50%, if not more, of the turnover of essential service businesses, which are restricted, as I say, to about 30 to 40% of your activities, if that, um, that you would ordinarily trade to. Now, what the block release was supposed to do was to get landlords to understand that they had to make the same sacrifice that their tenants were being asked to make. 
But in fact, the, the, the Minister of Trade and Industries, um, something purposefully, I think purposefully, gazetted the block release and then completely turned a blind eye on what happened in the property sector, knowing full well that the property owners would collude amongst one another to make it look as if they were doing something for their tenants, but still achieve some kind of margin in terms of the rentals they expected to earn, as opposed to completely mothballing their expectations in the same way that their tenants had to mothball their businesses. So it's an absolute imbalance in the property sector that is being created to the extent that the property owners are refusing to deal with the collective uh, constituencies of tenants in this country and insisting that they deal with tenants on an individual basis, even though they have come together to collude on a collective basis. That's the South African Property Owners Association, SA Rights, and the South African Shopping Centre Council. They've basically grouped themselves into this thing called PIGS, quite appropriately, I think, which is the, product, uh, the property industry group um, led by uh, uh, Neil of Sopoa. And quite frankly, they've come out with the most ridiculous offer to their tenants, which essentially is an offer that says, well, we'll give you some discount, but then we're expecting you to extend your leases on the one hand, and we'll then allow you to defer some of your payments, but we still want the money for the rent, but we'll allow you to defer those payments um, starting from the 1st of July over a six-month period. So they, they want their money for their rent, even though their tenants are prohibited from trading or from fully trading, as you are quite, quite aware of. Um, the reality is that wasn't the intention of the Department of Trade and Industry. In fact, Mohamed Vorda, who's one of the uh, senior managers in the Department of Trade and Industry, in response to me personally, a query that I submitted to him personally, came back and said, because I accused him of a whole lot of things. So he came back and said, all that we did is the attached regulations, which is a competition exemption, which allows tenants as a group to negotiate with landlords for rent reduction. So landlords at the moment are rejecting and resisting tenants acting as a group, number one, and then not allowing tenants to negotiate for rent reduction. Basically, they're saying that as the property industry group, it's a take it or leave it situation. And if you say you're not going to take it, well, we'll sue you um, for your full rentals. Now, we as the South African uh, Independent Tenants Association believe that landlords are in breach of their lease contracts with you, um, not intentionally, but only because uh, their shopping centers are a shadow of what they should be doing. There's no foot traffic in the shopping centers. Um, there's no passing trade. If people are coming to the shopping centers, it's to go to Diskim or Pick and Pay or Checkers. Um, and as a result, there's almost no passing trade or business to be had from the footfall. And therefore, the lease you entered into, the landlord is in breach of because he can't perform. It's an impossible expectation of performance. Um, and so this is a fight which we're only now starting to take up as the Independent Tenants Association because no one's done it for independent tenants up until now. It is a very much a steep uphill battle we're intending to climb because we know that your landlords will send their legal teams, they'll send their associations legal teams, um, and they'll, they'll pay off politicians and bribe politicians like they've always done um, to turn a blind eye and look the other way um, while they carry on with their nefarious activities. And we intend collectively that independent tenants who constitute something like 60% of individual tenants in this country in shopping centers, and we're not saying you constitute the massive uh, um, destination stores, we know you don't. But you constitute a large proportion of every shopping center where you operate, and we think you should have a voice, and we're intending for you to have that voice. And we understand that it's an uphill battle. We, we know that. We know it's not going to be easy, but we, we think it's a fight worth fighting. Um, now, our approach is threefold or fourfold, as you can see, because what we believe that we should be fighting for, for the independent tenants in this country, is as follows. Number one collective representation. So we think just like the famous brand groups is fighting for steers and for spurs and for, uh, uh, der, what's the, the pizza place called, Durego, whatever it's called, um, just as they're fighting for them, we think dynamic vision across all of the shopping centers where there are optometry practices, 
Uh, equally, we think spec savers across all of the shopping centers where there are spec savers should be fighting with a common voice. Uh, and that voice can be cited, the South African Independent Tenants Association, for collective representation of these small, these micro very often businesses, um, which just do not have the, 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 the firepower on their own to fight these large landlords. Um, funnily enough, there are some independent tenants who signed leases in their own name rather than in the name of their businesses. And those businesses are worth from a net asset value less than 2 million rand. And therefore, those businesses fall under what is called the Consumer Protection Act. And some of those tenants are trying to get out of their leases, not realizing that if they're in that situation, the Consumer Protection Act will allow them to exit their lease and in exiting their lease to potentially uh, have the promise of being able to renegotiate a new lease. Um, so if you signed your lease in your own name rather than the name of your business, um, you you would very much be covered by the CPA, the Consumer Protection Act, and you should talk uh, about that to me or, in fact, to your lawyer. Or, in fact, to whoever's put you under debt review if you've applied to be put under debt review, as we know many retailers, retail tenants, have uh, applied to. The third leg of the fight against landlords is the most difficult. It is to try and change the way they charge for rent. Um, about 20 years ago, the only mechanism in charging for rent was, in fact, what was called a percentage of turnover. Logic says that if your business is doing well, then you will pay a higher amount of money to your landlord than if your business is not doing well. That's a percentage of turnover. Um, the average is anywhere from 5 to 7%, uh, but in some instances, it can range as high as 10%. Um, the ophthalmologists are most probably having a heart attack as I speak because we know that the professionals do much higher turnover, but in that instance, uh, we're still fighting for a percentage of turnover formula rather than fixed rent, but a much lower percentage of turnover because of the relativity of what that rent should be to the turnover. Um, and so we are adamant to create a national campaign that is a sustainable campaign to force legislation in this country that says landlords should move from charging a fixed rental for size of property to a percentage of turnover to indicate that there is a sharing of the risk. Because in the retail business, retail is very, very risky. And there is really no other way to charge for rent than charge a percentage of turnover. Uh, I know some of you will say, but we actually have percentage of turnovers in our lease. You do, but there is a fixed rental. And then the percentage of turnover applies to your very good months, where in fact landlords have said it's unfair for us to charge a fixed rental and lose out when you have a really good month because uh, we want a percentage of that really good premium as uh, on top of that fixed rental. Um, and so we are saying that in fact it's that premium, that cream component of what's in your lease that should be the standard base component of what's in your lease moving forward. There is a comment from someone who says, for percentage of turnover, we cannot add our professional fees. Please correct me if I am wrong. Well, um, my answer to you is that we would need to work out for those of you who are um, offering professional services, uh, which constitute your, the majority of your turnover, we would need to reduce what, it, what that percentage would be that is charged to make sure that what you might owe a landlord in a good month is not an extraordinary amount um, of percentage. Um, but certainly you would add whatever constitutes the turnover of your business, whether it's a sale of retail product, in other words, the glasses and the lenses, et cetera, or in fact, of whether it's your professional fees. There is no restriction on one or the other um, because that constitutes the, the turnover of a business. That brings me to another point, by the way, and that's under E20 of the previous discussion on the regulation. Um, what you've got to realize, there are some people who say to me, well, it's too dangerous for me to go into my shop so what I'm, or my surgery. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work from home. I'll allow my patients to come and see me at home, and I will run what is virtually a, an e-business from home, but offering professional services, in other words, uh, examinations, etc. 
Now, your landlord is entitled to say that because you're trading under the name into, under which you entered into the lease with me, irrespective of where you're doing that work, whatever turnover you make is turnover that I've got a right to charge you a percentage of. And your landlord would be right. So my answer to you is if you have a second business and that second business is a completely different legal entity, in other words, it's registered as a second business, that is ideal. And if you're going to work from home or work somewhere else, trade under that name and not under the same name as the name that you're trading under your lease in a shopping center under. Um, uh, that was a very nice uh, observation uh, one, one of you have just made to me privately where you say, according to the Health Professions Council, we cannot share our profits from our professional fees. Does a percentage of turnover apply to this? I'm, I'm looking forward to being a fly on the wall when you try and uh, apply that with your landlord, where you're saying to your landlord's lawyers or legal team that our Health Professions Council says we're not allowed to share the profits from our professional fees with you. Because you and I both know that what they mean, what the Health Professions Council means, is not that. What they mean is about you working in team with cross-referral sources. So, for example, where you would uh, uh, set up in a surgery where there could be a doctor or even a dentist working from the same surgery where you're sharing rooms um, because of the opportunity for cross-referrals and, and, and particularly where those cross-referrals would border on cross-professional misconduct. But, but certainly that's something we can try. I'm only too happy to take that to the table. Um, because in, in my opinion, you've always got to have a certain number of red herrings in your negotiation exercise with your landlord, because you're hoping that they'll go after one of your red herrings rather than necessarily one of your main points. I'm being facetious, obviously. Um, I, I don't know whether the Health Professions Council has managed to succeed with generalizing that if you pay your rent based on the turnover where you've included your professional fees in that turnover, um, uh, uh, that you can be forced by your landlord to do that or not be allowed to do that by the Health Professions Council of South Africa. I've not yet heard of precedent in that regard where the H, uh, Health Professions Council has gone out to bat for you against your landlord, although it's certainly worth, I think, a group application to the, the uh, HPCSA, particularly on behalf of professional optometry practitioners, in other words, ophthalmologists, etc., and not necessarily the retail practitioners out there. I am going to say this to you, however, that if you are keeping your professional fees as optometrists from the calculation of your turnover in your business, um, you should continue to do that. Don't change your formula until it's contested. The final component of this four-pronged approach with landlords is for CITA to want to press for what we call reasonable exit clauses. Um, and that is that you should not enter, it's, it's your antinatural, but essentially you should not be entering into an agreement with your landlord that says that in the instance where we sign a five-year lease with you and we determine that the business is simply not working, we will be held to three and a half additional years to get out of that lease or to cancel our lease with you. Now, at the moment, your leases are, are created like that. Your leases are created where you're basically a slave to your landlord for the full lease period, irrespective of whether your business is operating or not. And what we want to do is we want to press for legislation in this country. It's not going to be easy because a lot of these politicians have been bought by the property development sector, but we want to press for legislation in this country that would allow reasonable exit clauses to exist for small retailers doing less than 30 million rand. And what we're saying here is that irrespective of the length of the lease, if your business is not working out and you can prove that your business is in distress, we want you to be able to have a three maximum four month uh, exit clause so that you're able to give notice and the cost of giving notice might be you know, three months or maybe even two months. And that's it. You can walk away from the business with your life intact so that you can have a hope of starting again and trying to make a go of something else. Um, because at the moment, our legal system says that if you set up a retail business which fails, your life is literally going to be ruined for five years or longer if that business fails. Um, because your landlord is going to treat himself as a preferential creditor 
before your own staff who are in fact true preferential creditors in your business. And unfortunately, both our legal system and our legislative system in this country has turned a blind eye, we think, for far too long to landlords in their relationships with retailers. Uh, any questions about how you deal with landlords and managing agents, ladies and gentlemen, because I've only given you the, the blue sky stuff and not really dealt with you know, what we're intending or rather how we want to intend to go about making these things a reality. Any questions about your landlord activities? Okay. I'm glad to see that you've all had good relationships there and you have good relationships with your landlords. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, we, we now come to the notion of dealing with the Department of Trade and Industries. And what astounds me every time I talk to medical professional fraternities such as your own, and I've spoken so far to the dentists, I've spoken so far to some of the speciality groups, um, and now I'm talking to you guys. What astounds me is that me calling your optometry business a business is somehow a, a dirty word. It has a negative connotation to it. To call you a business person, first and foremost, because you run a business which employs four or five or ten people, you have stock in your business, which constitutes at least, I don't know, 50% of your net asset value of your business. You have a debtor's book. You have a creditor's book. And you need to have business tools in your business. What astounds me is that there is no employer association for your business. And you are not a trade association. But you're a professional association or you're members of a professional body. What astounds me is that your professional association is not also an employer association. These are missing components of the COGS of what makes different industries work in South Africa. But I am advocating for you to have a trade association, an employer association, for the business of retail and manufacturing optometric practices in South Africa, because there are hundreds, if not thousands, of your kinds of businesses around the country. And as such, you constitute a major cog in the employment uh, within the, the small business sector, a major cog, cog of employment within the small business sector. If there are 500 of you and you each employ five people and each person has nine dependents in their family, which is the average in South Africa, that's a very large smack of our population that is dependent on the success of optometry businesses in South Africa. And yet, as tax-paying entities, as VAT-paying entities, as PAYE-paying entities, you get absolutely no supply side incentives from the Department of Trade and Industry. And that's how Ruan and I got talking because I said to Ruan, I said that you should be talking to the Department of Trade and Industry about supply side incentives, which are available to every industry in this country. Just like the electricians and the plumbers and the call center industry get a billion here, a two billion there of supply side incentives to galvanize your businesses, to grow your businesses, to be innovative, to be transformative. None of that money is actually flowing from the Department of Trade and Industry to you out of the tax money that you collectively pay as businesses. And so as a result, I'm urging you to, to think about in the short term, applying to the Department of Trade and Industry for aid and relief packages for your businesses as small businesses, small professional, small essential service businesses that are not going to survive the lockdown until we get to level one, unless the Department of Trade and Industry come to the party with specific relief for you as optometrists in this country. But then also to talk to DTI once we're out of this lockdown, to talk to them specifically about the idea of supply side incentives, especially for those of you in the manufacturing sector. Those of you in the manufacturing sector have an opportunity to move into the export sector so easily if the Department of Trade and Industry was prepared to come to the party with machinery, tools, and equipment, 
and importantly, to create avenues for you to display your products globally and internationally. That's what the DTI is there for. And in terms of export council work, that's what they're supposed to be offering you. And yet so little of it. I mean, there's one of you that's told me you're a manufacturer in this entire sector. There are 58 million people in this country, which means there are over 120 million odd eyes in this country. And yet there's one South African, maybe I'll give you the benefit of the doubt and say 10 South African manufacturers in your sector. I mean, that, those numbers don't sound right. And so, Ruan, what I'm saying to you on behalf of the X number you might represent, and then what I'm saying to you collectively on behalf of all the optometry practitioners and practices in this country, is there is a huge amount of relief, but there's also a huge amount of supply-side assistance. You should be demanding from the Department of Trade and Industry, and I'm going to say something that's very controversial. If you wait for the Health Professions Council to apply for you as businesses to DTI, that's never going to happen. You have to wake up. You have to, you have to do these things. Activate and agitate for yourselves as businesses, small businesses, independently of the Health Professions Council, the Allied Health Professions Council, and the Department of Health, I'm sorry to say. I see there are a couple of questions that go back to landlords. One of you saying, my landlords give me a 25% discount on my rental, excluding electricity and water. Jenny, I don't understand why 25% sounds attractive unless you're telling me that the turnover you're doing under lockdown, even as an essential business, is 75% of what you ordinarily would do. Then the 25% makes sense. In other words, if you're trading to 75% of your normal turnover, then the landlord saying, we recognize that. You've shown us the figures. We recognize it. And we'll compensate you for the 25% you're not doing in turnover by giving you a 25% reduction in your rent, that makes sense. That's very fair. But if your landlord is offering you 25%, when in fact, what I know about essential businesses, essential service businesses, is that on average, they're doing 25% of their normal turnover. If that, then in fact, that 25% is a slap in your face. Then Bobby says, what if out of fear, you've agreed to a bad deal on your April lease negotiation and you want out or want to renegotiate. Well, Bobby, then you you get tough. You say, right, you know, I'll pay you rates and taxes and water and light, but that's all I'm going to pay you. And come after me for the balance, bearing in mind that a landlord is not allowed to apply for your eviction. In fact, a landlord is not allowed to apply for any legal action against you until we get to level one in this country. Um, Bobby, I would suggest you have a chat to us at CITA and see what we can do for you. You know, if you've already made payment for April, that's good because then you can always set off May and June and July and August until such time as you're happy with what you've got. The one thing I do want to point out, ladies and gentlemen, is this, that your landlords and PIGS, the property industry group, in their offer to the large retailers, no agreement has ever made allowance for something we call the recovery period. Now, the recovery period is what happens after lockdown. Because we're anticipating that in retail, it's going to take you a minimum of six months to a year to recover to the extent that you're doing the same kind of turnover that you were doing in the last six months of last year, which is where you want to measure yourself against. You don't want to measure yourself against January, February, and March of this year, because by the end of January, COVID had already started. Um, social distancing had already started and people were not coming into retail environments. So you want to look at the last six months of last year. And we're anticipating in retail that it's going to take between six months and a year for that recovery period to be successful, for you to get back to what is acceptable turnover in your business. And so what we're saying to landlords, is it's all very well giving, you us, giving us dispensation for April, May, June, maybe July, if that's the period of lockdown until we get to level one, but what happens after we get to level one? You need to continue to compensate us in some way or another for that recovery period. We need to share the risk for the recovery period and therefore do a percentage of turnover rather than fixed rentals for that full six months to a year recovery period before we go back anywhere close to either a fixed rental or to a higher percentage of percentage of turnover to work out what rents we owe you. 
Um, and Jana says, oh, Jenny says, no, it's more like as an essential business, I'm only doing 3% of my turnover. I can well understand that, Jenny. Um, and Jana says, I got offered 50% off the rental for April. That's good. It's a good start, and Jana. But then just remember, if you were in lockdown in April, that means you've still got to find the other 50% and you weren't making turnover. And if you were essential service, you were not making 50% of your turnover in April. I can guarantee you that. So, Ivor, can I ask a question here quickly, please? Of course you can, Peter. Um, sorry, I, just, I don't want to hijack your meeting here at all, so I'm going to make it very quick. Um, half of the people obviously know me. I know Ruan spoke to you. Uh, I've helped a couple of the people here. Just a quick question. Um, up to now... I've obviously, I, I'm a retail agent and I deal with uh, with everybody and fighting the fight with everybody at this point in time. What have you achieved thus far with uh, amongst the landlords? Now that I see all the questions about uh, discounts offered, it's actually quite atrocious what these people are saying because uh, we've received uh, quite substantial discounts up to now through negotiations. So... Uh, it's a very good question. We've dealt so far with 38 shopping centers. Remember that we've been going for six weeks as a collective. We've dealt with 38 shopping centers on behalf of about 620 odd independent tenants so far. Um, on average, we've seen a 30, 30 to 40 percent increase in what's been offered for April. We've seen on average, which is very good, I think, a 30 percent increase in what's been offered for for uh, May. Um, we've seen. Um, Four separate landlords coming to the party with offers for June, whereas, as you know, pigs um, uh, are, are talking about a different size of retailer in that regard. Um, I can say that out of the six, let's just say 600, I can say we've had about a 25% success rate with those 600 in terms of initial negotiation. We've seen absolutely no acknowledgement of the recovery period by any single landlord. And we know that the reason for that is that um, there's been collusion in the PIGS group, the property industry group, uh, by members of SAPOA, SA Rights, and the South African Shopping Center Council. Um, so that's what we've seen so far um, in response to your question. A uh, very nice point from Cornelia that says, I got 85% for April and 100% for May, deferment of 50% for June. Cornelia, that's absolutely fantastic. That, that's a good landlord who's been prepared to come to the party. Again, my assumption is that they've allowed you then to defer the other 50% for June um, and they've given you at least six months to be able to pay that other 50%. And my assumption is that they haven't given you a recovery period um, allowance in any respect whatsoever. But Peter, in answer to your question, it is exceptionally hard to break this cabal that is being created amongst landlords. Um, and I needn't tell you, I mean, you've been doing this for small retail a lot longer than we have. Well, you've been doing it formally for retail a lot longer than we have. Uh, many of those involved in CITA have been tenants themselves for long periods of time with multiple shopping centers. Um, but it is no, time now. Is last... it is, sorry, I just want to say this. It is now time collectively. to. You're never going to have an opportunity as tenants that you have now to break this cabal. If we can't break the cabal now, we will never again be able to break this cabal amongst landlords. Agreed with you 100%. It's a, it's a, it's a specific uh, point in time uh, that should be utilized. Uh, I think the conversation can go on forever, so maybe we should talk offline. Um, obviously, uh, Ruan might have said that you, as an, as an ex-landlord executive, <laughs> I walked away for this reason specifically and I started supporting independent tenants, but uh, I think we should chat offline so that uh, I can give you some inside info from that side and, Fantastic. Um, uh, Fantastic. and chat a little bit about what's best for, for the tenants now and the future. You'd be very um, surprised. Do you know that there's a WhatsApp group of your kind of character out there who've, who've like defected from the landlord side? So I'll be very happy to put you in touch with those guys as well. All right. Excellent. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Appreciate that. Thanks. All right. So moving on, ladies and gentlemen, um, Ruan says, what is a good deal that we as optometrists can accept? Ruan, look, I think that what I'm learning very, very quickly is that this battle 
to change the way the landlords think in terms of percentage of turnover is going to take a long time. It's going to need a lot of pressure, particularly from civil society, and it's going to need a sustained event or set of events to make it a reality. Um, I know personally that the only way to get that to happen is to change the law, and therefore the pressure point is not going to be on landlords. The pressure point is going to be on the Trade and Industry Portfolio Committee in Parliament when they get back to their activities. And I have a number of MPs who are prepared to, in fact, push for that to happen with Trade and Industries as a Portfolio Committee because they're unhappy about the cabal uh, extending to politicians and the influence of politicians to protect their interests, both at local and at national government level. So for me, a good, a good agreement would be this. An agreement that says 100% for April, for those businesses that were locked down in April, and a minimum of 50% for April for those businesses which were essential services. Unfortunately, the PIGS agreement says that if you were essential services that were open, then in fact you get no compensation whatsoever, irrespective of whether you did the 3% that Jen is talking about or you were lucky enough to do 15 to 20%. You have to pay 100% of rent. So for me, a good agreement at this stage is number one, to get either 100% for those businesses that were locked down for April and at least 50% for those businesses that were in essential services for April. And the same for May, given that the circumstances are identical in May. Um, going forward, if level four extends to June and to the end of June, then again, exactly the same thing. 100% for lockdown businesses, 50% for uh, essential service businesses, with the other 50% being deferred with a minimum of a six-month repayment period. Remember, all along, for April, for May, and for June in that example, you would be tendering rates and taxes and water and lights. Um, but at the same time, you would be insisting on knowing, on seeing that the landlords are going to local council and trying to get aid and relief from local council, which is very easily available. If your landlord comes back and says, well, we've been to local council and we cannot get deferment at least, if not aid from local council, which means a reduction, then they're telling you something that's very, very telling in its own right. Because what they're telling you, ladies and gentlemen, is this. They're telling you that the council doesn't trust us. The council have rejected our request. And the only time the council rejects requests is if the landlord's own position with the council is not regularized. When the landlord has not paid his rates and taxes, Council are not going to give them deferment. Now, what that's telling you is you've been paying over to the landlord who might not necessarily have been paying over to council unless you're paying council directly, which is very few of the occasions. So you're entitled because remember, you're the customer. You're entitled to ask why are you as the landlord not getting deferment and why are you not passing the deferment on to me, bearing in mind I'm locked down or partially locked down. So you need to be on top of that and you need to stay on top of that, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Ivan, may I um, uh, pop in here and just pause on the landlords for a second or would you rather like to um, handle the, some of my questions at the end? I think no, I'm very really happy for you to now. ask your questions while we're dealing with it now. Thank you very much. So the question is begging uh, is that which, uh, some, which practices are wanting to open or not? And the question really is, if we open our, if, if I can backtrack, some store, some practices that um, practice out of their own houses and, and, and they are their own landlords have opened. However, majority of us in shopping centers, either just pop in to have a look and do some emergency stuff. But if we start opening now, would that negate our negotiating power with the landlord to ask for the 100% um, discount or yes, would I be so, so okay. let me answer your question right at the very start let me answer your question like this if your landlord has made you any kind of offer in writing up until now and you go and you open tacitly you have accepted what they offered you you've you've literally negated your right to negotiate anything better than what they've offered you that's the first point i want to make if however you've not received an offer but you open without having a deal on the table with your landlord, then basically you've agreed to continue to pay the normal lease that you're being charged for. Now that stands to reason, all right? So the point I'm trying to make to you, yes. if you've got an offer on the table and you are questioning the offer, 
the moment you open your doors, you've tacitly accepted the offer. So, does that include does that include that you pop in and just look at uh, cleaning the shop or no, having no, some no, emergency no, no, services no, no, no. or you, stuff like that? As long that as you're not you're... as long as you're not opening your doors to trade, you're entitled to go into your shop. In fact, the president in his very first lockdown speech said, and he used the example of mines, but he was talking about all kinds of businesses. That in many instances, you need to make sure that your business is properly secured. You need to make sure that your machines are working. You don't let your machines go to rack and ruin because they're not being switched on and regularly run if they're needing to be regularly run. Um, and that goes for your computers as well. You are fully entitled to go into your business and make sure that things are ticking in your business and then leave your business without trading from your business. It's only about when you open your doors to trade or when you're there for a protracted period of time because you have made consultation appointments that, in fact, you are tacitly trading. And if you're tacitly trading, you're tacitly trading under the terms of your lease unless you have a new agreement. So you've just got to be very, very careful about how you position yourself in that regard. So I assume if people pop in their stores, they would, you know, that will be probably limited to an hour or two a day or every second day. Yeah, you can, you but can go into your there, store and you can stay in your store for the entire day doing administration work. There's, there's no issue because your doors are closed and, and you're entitled to, 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 under lockdown even, you're entitled to, you know, be doing the kind of administration that might allow you to work from home for the next day or the next period of time, et cetera, et cetera. But again... I'm going to say to you from a legal perspective, if you're trading from home and you're trading under the same name that your lease is registered in, your landlord is entitled to say to you, all you did was move premises, but your business is still running. And so as a result, the lease still extends to you. So you've just got to be slightly careful in that regard. You've, you've got to be wary. Yeah. The reason why we, I'm asking these questions is that both the SAOA and the Health Professional Council has been very vague of what exactly... Um, where do we fit in essential services? And so much so, the latest communication is they will leave the owners in the, uh, in the hands of the optometrist to decide That's what is an emergency. That's why right? Correct. So they clearly state that we're open for emergencies only, but now the problem is, you know, it's very difficult to define an emergency, you know, if someone can, cannot read or they can't drive or where it is. So it's a very, very gray area for us. However, I do not think that we will be um, expecting lots of patients to run in. Maybe it's just a backlog and that's where the risk is that I want to share or educate our, our group and optometrists. The, the risk is that if you go in and you start opening is the exact point where you made that once you're there and you're opening the door, you're accepting the lease responsibility if there's no deal on the table and you will, will be demanded to pay rent. Is that correct? That's the problem. Um, you can see clarification from your landlord that that's not the case. So you can see clarification from your landlord that if I have to work on an hourly basis or, uh, you know, for a particular emergency, etc., can we agree on an hourly rate or something? But your landlord's going to come back and say, you know, I've got a lease with you. Uh, there's no such thing as an hourly rate. So you just need to be wary of it. You can, by the way, put, a, put an alternative proposal to your landlord. If your landlord doesn't reply to your alternative proposal, and part of your alternative proposal is I'm putting this proposal to you that I pay you 40% of rent because I'm intending to be open for 40% of the normal time in the course of a month, and your landlord doesn't come back to you and you go into your work, place of work, then in fact the onus is on your landlord to have rejected that. And if he doesn't reject it, then tacitly your landlord has agreed to those terms uh, applying in your business. Um, but I would very I think that's a very valid Sorry, yes? Th th that's, a, that's a very valid point, which was my question. next question to what is our next step, because our group has been very active and uh, we have communicated with the landlords. And the last letter that we have uh, that we actually sent off individually was something to that effect. And it's almost as if the landlord's communication have in, in overall gone very quiet and they haven't responded to that or replied to us. And that's where I think we're having a lot of optometrists in this group anticipating saying, but what the hell now? And, and maybe that's the answer. If we send them a letter and we heard often they haven't accepted the offer, we can actually proceed according to our offer and start opening our doors. Absolutely. Until they come back to you or if they come back to you at all, in which case, you, you know, you'd, you'd have to deal with it as and when. It's a very, very gray area that you're operating under. Um, and so you've just got to, you've just got to step carefully. Um, by the way, there, there has been another question uh, on, on, on WhatsApp to me, which says, please clarify the position of the percentage of employees allowed to work at any given time. Um, 
So there was a, a, a requirement that you wouldn't have more than 50 people in your place of work at any moment in time. That section, I think it was section 23 or 28, that's now been dropped. And it's simply a case of uh, whatever your standard operating protocol is that you've had to put in writing for your medium to large size businesses to operate or for a business employing more than 10 people, quite frankly. So the point I'm trying to make to you is in answer to that question, um, first of all, you are entitled in every one of the definitions that we've looked at um, of the new regulation. You're entitled to have all of your employees back to work. Um, but you've got to bear in mind social distancing. If you have a lot of employees in a small place of work, then in fact, you're going to have to run in shifts. But I doubt that applies to the majority of you. Um, I mean, in retail shops, for example, you'd have maybe a maximum of five people, maybe 10 people working. Uh, so if you've got 10 people, you know, maybe have two shifts. But outside of that, uh, as long as you can socially distance two to three meters between you, you should be fine. You should be fine. Uh, Ruan, any other questions about landlord issues um, before we move forward? Yes, yes. Is, um, I don't want to mention other franchises, but there, there are some of the franchises that are only opening much later. And I think it's based on commercial sense that they feel that they won't do the turnover to open. And in fact, I think they're taking a concept of we are an emergency um, situation, emergency lockdown, and they're applying the force majeure um, concept on both sides and saying, well, we don't have a contract in place, we can't trade, we're not going to pay rent. Uh, what is your opinion on that? So explain how that would work in your context. In your context, our context is that um, we're under lockdown. Um, we're under a state, almost a state of emergency. Um, we have no agreement with you. We're not going to pay your rent and we're not going to open until um, the lockdown is over. And on that point in time, we'll open and start paying rent normally again. Okay. So purely legally, they're entitled to say to you, especially if they've contracted out of force majeure, and many of the landlords have, for example, high prop, et cetera, contracted out of force majeure, even though we think that's illegal. But if they have... They're entitled to say to you, you know, you've got a lease with me, irrespective of whether you open or not, you're going to have to pay me on the lease. Because remember, they've been allowed by DTI not to suspend their expectations, even though you've been locked down. Um, and, and so they, they won't sue you now, but they'll sue you after we've got beyond level one and things are trading and the courts are open again. Then they'll send their lawyers after you if there's no agreement. Um, particularly if there's no negotiated settlement or if they've made an offer to you that you haven't accepted. Um, the landlords, they've been told within their SAPOA cabal, within the SA Right cabal, and within the uh, council, shopping center council cabal, they've been told that they have all the legal rights in the world to insist on their full margins of their lease agreement, which legally is the case. We're having to overturn those agreements on the base of what is in commercial law referred to as supervening impossibility. Through no fault of theirs and through no fault of yours, you cannot trade. Or if you do trade, it doesn't make sense for you to trade, incurring the overheads you're incurring. And so it's a supervening impossibility. But in this instance, it's not COVID. It's the instruction of government to lock down or it's the alert levels, which in fact have become the supervening impossibility. So they will assert their right in terms of the lease agreement, and you will assert your interest, which is supervening impossibility, asking the courts to rule on that interest becoming a counter right. Uh, so it is a legal mess. It's a legal nightmare. We're trying to avoid it by engaging with landlords. But Peter, I want to come back to you and say generally landlords are not approachable. They've agreed amongst themselves that they wouldn't be approachable. They've also agreed amongst themselves that they wouldn't allow for representation as a collective and very often for representation as an individual. In your instance, it might be different because you might have been the one who negotiated that agreement to begin with. Um, but ordinarily, landlords have taken the decision not to allow that kind of representation, which, by the way, is anti-constitutional. And we're dealing with that um, as an infringement of the constitutional rights of the retailers. But this is a massively uphill battle because, to be honest, retailers have not fought this fort before. And this is the first time in the last six weeks now that this fight is being fought. Um, so you can imagine how much of an uphill battle it is. All right. Uh, if I may ask, what advice are you giving your uh, members? I mean, I've joined as well, and 
if I may just point out the invitation that was sent out to everybody, the information is there to join and, and maybe you can touch on, on the advantages at the end there. But I, my question really is at the moment, what advice are you telling us? What, what would you give us as a take home message with the land board? So well, I think there's, there's a little bit of uncertainty with, with everybody so, on that. So Ron, I would say this to you. I would say, Number one, you have to know what it is you've got to bargain with. So what you're putting on the table are rates and taxes and operational overheads if you want to. And there's some tenants who are saying we're not going to pay operational overheads, particularly if we're locked down, but the essential service businesses are using common areas. Why should we pay for common areas? So the first bit of advice is know what you have to bargain with. Know what you're offering. And what you're offering are rates and taxes and all of those operational overheads. Fine. But that's what you're holding on to. You don't automatically surrender it until you've got an agreement or unless you are very afraid that somehow the landlord is going to pursue against you in one way or another. So that's the first thing. Know what it is that you're actually what you have to offer. Now, as far as the landlords are concerned, what you might want to do to buy yourself enough time if things are from a cash flow perspective very, very bad is seriously consider entering into debt review because debt review doesn't mean you're going to sequestrate yourself. It means that you, the landlord officially doesn't have a right to pursue against you for a minimum of three months on the basis that you've entered into a legislated program that protects you from a landlord who wants to do something bad to you. Either, you know, declare, uh, make an application for your personal sequestration if you're a surety or for your business's insolvency so you can take over your assets, whatever it is. The moment you put yourself into debt review, or your business into business rescue, and neither of those are have the connotation of it's something that I'm going to be blacklisted for. But the moment you do that, you buy yourself enough time. If your business is really has a cash flow problem and you cannot secure any kind of bridging finance, so it's critically important that you don't see debt review or business rescue as 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 bad ideas. That's the first point I want to make in that regard. So number one, know what it is you have to give, what you're offering, what's on the table, because possession is nine-tenths of the law. So you're going to hold back until you've got some kind of an agreement before you pay those things, especially if the landlord doesn't have terms from the municipality. So the municipality is putting pressure on the landlord to pay those things, which, by the way, as I said initially, is highly unlikely. Then what you do is you say, right, we're going to work – Forward, going forward from the pigs agreement. So our minimum negotiating stance is what pigs say. And we're going to move forward on the basis that we're small retailers. I would say that your expectation shouldn't be more than 50% discount for any month of lockdown and 50% deferment. That's a, not a bad situational position to come away with. I would say very much that you want to move towards some kind of compensation for the recovery period, if you can get a recovery period. And I noticed that there was someone here who mentioned that there was deferment recovery period from 1st of October to 30th of June. Okay, but that's a different issue. That's saying that your landlord still wants his money for April, May, and June, but he's prepared to wait for his money and not charge you interest if you pay him, you know, in terms of the repayment period or charge you interest if you're going to miss one of those repayment periods. Um, when I talk about recovery period, I'm actually saying no. Percentage of turnover, reduced percentage of turnover on a staggered basis for the 6 to 12 months is going to take your business to recover. You have to know what you want to go into that negotiation with. So I'm saying 50% uh, a discount, 50% deferment for April, May, June. Anything more than that is a good offer, but you're going to need the recovery period. And importantly, and I cannot stress this enough, and I get passionately angry when I see landlords like the Tower Group, like Hyprop, um, like a number of these groups, where they say, okay, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll give you 100% deferment for April, but we want you to sign a one-year extension of your lease agreement. And by the way, if you want deferment for May, we'll give you 50% discount and 50% deferment for May, but then you've got to sign another one-year's extension of your lease agreement. So I've seen an agreement in the Cape Quarter, for example. I was looking at it yesterday. In the Cape Quarter, where ta the tower group offered a, a tenant, we'll give you 100% deferment for April. We'll give you 50% deferment for May. We want you to sign a three-year extension of your lease.
So you, what we're saying is what is, what is honest and genuine as an offer is to say for each month that you would give me some kind of aid or relief, April aid, May aid, June aid, or relief, deferment. For each month, you're going to do something for me. I'll sign a month's extension of my lease agreement. That's fair. That's, that's genuine. But if I'm going to sign an extension of my lease agreement, there's no escalation. I don't want escalation built into that lease. So that's how you would negotiate. Thank you. I think that's very fair. Um, in, the, in the back of, the, uh, of us as optometrists or uh, um, tenants, we're thinking, well, um, how hard do we go in with the landlord? And are they going to eventually punish us later when we have to re-sign leases or do not want to renew leases? Because that's human, unfortunately. Or is that a fight we, we take on later? Well, I think that um, my answer to you is whether it's CITA or it's any kind, or it's PETA, for example. It sounds to me like PETA is very, very well placed to maybe be doing it with you. But however you do it, it's a case of needing a relationship of representativity that's not going to go away. It's not only for the COVID period. And if your landlord is going to be unfair to you in the negotiation process, um, I think it's critically important that as a, as a business person, you have the flexibility of knowing you're the customer, the client of that landlord, that you're not beholden to your landlord, and that there is a way of actually shifting premises if it's necessary. Shifting premises to better landlords, and there are some good landlords out there. So I, you know, I, I don't want to be blasé about it and say it's easy to shift. I know some of you, in fact, I know some of you, so I know some of you have shifted regularly, you know, when your landlords become bad players or bad apples. But the bottom line is you don't always want to shift. You want, to, you want a relationship with the landlord so that you don't have to worry about that side of your business operation, so that your landlord becomes a partner in your business and not a preferential creditor in your business. And that's, that's, you know, that's the kind of culture you want to set with your landlords. I know I'm talking in generalities, Ron, I'm sorry. I can't give you anything specific, except to say that you, if you're part of a collective association with a code of practice, then you're entitled on a regular basis to be talking to the competition commission, to the consumer commission, and to know that there, you have rights. So you're not allowed to be marginalized or victimized. Well, that's highly unlikely landlords are going to con continue doing that simply because of what's happening to the retail sector in South Africa. It's highly unlikely that that's going to continue. I think landlords are going to be bending over backwards to keep you guys in the future. Well, I hope so. I do agree with you that if there's one opportunity for us to stand together and maybe even optometry, which includes independent groups, franchises, to go forward as an umbrella, being part of an association, I think that's the answer to go. But we, we will we'll plan a strategy on that. I just see Angina had one more question there, and so um, I'll before, keep quiet. Just before Angina's question, I want to deal with Alison's question, which is fantastic. What if your landlord closed for COVID-19 cases without informing you as a tenant? Well, quite frankly, if your landlord closed, first of all, they're in breach of their lease agreement. Because remember, you have a lease agreement that says that you are renting a business in a shopping center that's open, that has a certain amount of footfall and a certain amount of attractive and certain amount of destination stores. If any of that is not true, then your landlord is in breach of his own agreement with you. And if he's in breach of his agreement with you, you can sue him for breach of agreement, which means you can actually sue him for business losses and damages, especially if he closes a shopping center, but at the same time is not prepared to forgive you your lease and literally put your lease into mothballs until he opens under a level one. So you're in a much better position, Alison, if your landlord's closed the shopping center. Um, and, uh, and Jana says... Uh, if there are five practices in the mall and one opens to trade while the others don't, how does this impact those who don't in terms of rental concessions? Well, the bottom line is that it's, it's really about your landlord. And it's what, what's important is if one opens, then the other four or other five are entitled to say to the landlord, we're certainly not paying common area operational costs because there's only one business benefiting. That business must pay those common area operational costs. And that's part of your negotiated settlement. But the problem is your landlord is always going to adopt the notion that he has a signed lease, which is a signed contract in concrete with you that just cannot be broken. So, yes, you have an uphill battle, but you have the right of civil society on your side and you have to activate civil society. What we're trying to do as CITA is literally activate the media as pigs activated the media. 
We're trying to activate your customers and clients to get them to sign petitions so that we can take those petitions to parliament so that we can get parliament to change the law. We think that parliament should outlaw the notion of fixed rentals. They should make the only way of charging rent in this country percentage of turnover. We think that there should be a maximum of a three-month cancellation clause in any kind of business, irrespective of the length of lease that's been signed. And that's what we will push for in Parliament. And we know it's not going to be an easy battle. And we know that it's going to take possibly many years to accomplish. But the bottom line is eventually the politician that campaigns on our mandate, on our ticket, is the politician that will be elected to Parliament eventually. So we know that it's a matter of time before we turn the tables on these landlords. And maybe that's where I will end, uh, because I know we've gone at least a half an hour over what we anticipated the session being. But maybe that's where I will end. Ladies and gentlemen, we've only been going as CITA for the last six weeks, although CITA has been registered since 2014. But for specifically for this purpose of dealing with the COVID fiasco, the COVID disaster. And what we find is an industry where the small independent tenant has been rubbish, has been trampled over and under for the last 40 or 50 years. So we've got a massive amount of catching up to do. But all I can say, it's better late than never. And that's where we are at this moment in time. So, um, uh, uh, Ruan, I, I hope I've answered some of your questions. I would love for there to be an alliance between CITA on the one hand and Dynamic Vision on the other hand and any other of the groups on the other hand within optometry so that we can talk collectively, so that we can initiate a, a, a shopping center-wide approach uh, uh, for Dynamic Vision to negotiate on behalf of its tenants, exactly like the famous brands group does for all of its uh, uh, brands within the various shopping centers, like Truist does and has done, et cetera, et cetera. Because that kind of size gives you clout. And our constitution allows for the right, right of affiliation. And the block release is what DTI has allowed to happen so that affiliation takes place. Now is the only time you're going to have to form and join associations before they remove the block release and the Competition Commission starts accusing you of collusion. So thank you for that. And uh, thank you for giving me the uh, opportunity to talk to you. I've really appreciated the opportunity, Ruan, and hopefully we can, do, we can do good things in the future together. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of all optometrists, uh, we really thank you for your time. Um, I know you're doing it for the passion. You, you're not being paid for it. And uh, we really appreciate it. And I think we'll seize the opportunity to get optometrists to stand together. There was a question uh, from our side at what is the monthly joining fee with, with SATA? And I think you answered it to me so, at the time, but you so want to Ron, maybe just repeat SATA it? has no joining fee until October, and then it's 50 rand a month, basically, with a month's notice think, period. I think we all need to join for that to get the cloud. And we will certainly be the pioneers of advocating that in the industry. Uh, there was there was one question by Kim PPP. I, I think it meant PPE. So the one thing I do want to say to you is I think at the very least what you should be saying to the Department of Trade and Industry is that the cost of personal protection personal pr protection equipment for someone like yourselves who works in personal contact with your patients is absolutely critical. It's absolutely critical either from a, a tax deduction perspective or a tax supplementation perspective, a VAT supplementation perspective, or an actual subsidy from the Department of Trade and Industry. I think you've got a good argument to make that outside of dentists, you guys are in more regular contact with patients than, than most other professions. And because of that, the costs you're going to have to incur for your personal protection equipment is going to be astronomical if you are going to be treated as essential services and required to do essential services. And I think that you should be approaching the Health Professions Council in that regard because they should be negotiating subsidies for PPE. Um, and if they can't do it or they're not prepared to do it, then you should be going directly to the DTI to do it with the DTI. Thanks so much, Ruhan. I will make a copy of the uh, recording available to you so that you can then uh, make it available to your members. But thank you very much. It's been great chatting to you guys.